Well, good morning. Welcome to North Creek Church. If we haven't met, my name is Chris, and I am excited to be with you this morning. Y'all good? All right. Hey, we are in a series called Witnessing the Unstoppable, and uh, we are really traveling through the book of Acts. So if you have your scriptures Today, you can turn them on. We'll be in Acts chapter 6 today. Um, that's where we will begin. Um, but just kind of way of like talking a little bit about the missions trip. So we sent 14 people uh, to the missions trip. I'll just read their names because they're, they're heroes. Uh, Mark, Rick, Selby, Joe, Drew, Tia, Nina, Colin, Aaron, Nick, Adam. I thought it was Nick, Rick. I got it. Okay. Adam, Grace, X, and myself. And we all went... We all went on your behalf. So I know there was many of you who wanted to go, wished you could go, but you were unable to go. And so we went on your behalf. Uh, you were sending us to go and really help a, a camp who'd been devastated by fire. And we spent those four days, we were travel day on Sunday, but three days actual working, um, doing, laying the groundwork for spiritual breakthrough. Can I tell you that sometimes that we, we miss the idea, we think like the spiritual breakthrough that happens in the 3,500 students that will come to that camp is because some preacher or speaker got invited or some worship team showed up and some youth ministry was there. That's generally like what we credit the breakthrough in people's lives for. But can I tell you that it's often the groundwork that leads to the spiritual breakthrough in people's lives. Let me just give you a case in point. Do you realize that before I ever preach, people come into the groundwork of North Creek Church. They are interfacing with Jesus, who is you, the church, and their me the message, the sermon that we preach before we ever get up here happens in the parking lot. It happens in the courtyard. The way that things look, the way things appear is sending a message. Whether you smile or glare <laughs> sends a message, right? You've been in places, and not just churches, but you've been to places where you were the new person, and you walked in the door knowing no one, and you read everybody's faces, whether wrong or right, but you read them all, and you silently came up with the conclusion about what they think about you. Sometimes we see when new people come into the church, they know that these messages are there, and they get into themselves into a holy huddle, right, where it's like, okay, kids, let's huddle together. We're going to Shuffle into the church together, and it's a protective kind of, you know, life vest around us. Because the message doesn't start at 1030 on a Sunday morning. The message starts at 945 when new people walk in. That it's often the ground you lay is the spiritual breakthrough in people's lives. Do you know that? That many people ground through bad worship, which we don't have, and bad messages, which we're trying to not have, right? If the groundwork in the lobby is phenomenal, you have friends at church who, or people who just are wanting to see you, right? You know what I mean? Sometimes you don't need a friend. You just need somebody who wants to see you on a Sunday morning. That's it. You know, like, I don't have any friends here, but they all want to see me. And I feel like I need to go because those people like me. I like that. Don't work. That leads to spiritual breakthrough in people's lives. That the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, before anybody ever walks on this stage, and the groundwork of fixing a camp for 3,500 students to come during the summer is, going, is laying a path for spiritual breakthrough in their life. And oftentimes in church, we want to feel like we are making an impact. We want the upfront ministries. We want the titles. We want the stage. We want the thing. That's how we know we're being significant. But I'll say it again. Often it's the groundwork that leads to spiritual breakthrough. All right, if you have your copies of scriptures, you're in luck because we are in a story in the book of Acts that teaches us this exact same thing. So case in point, we are in a place where the scriptures teach us that it's the groundwork that often leads to spiritual breakthrough. So if you have your scriptures, Acts chapter 6, if you're following on our Version app, you can click on the events tab and all of our notes for today's service will be in there. If you just want to do nothing, they will be on the screen and you are welcome to sit back and relax. And my friend Talia will make sure you are well informed, okay? 
All right. Everybody looks at Talia and she's like, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 6, starting in verse 1. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation for today. But as believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Pause. They're a mega church. I don't have a better term for it. They're 5,000 strong or more. This is everything that we in our, nor- in our northern, like our, uh, uh, our, our culture, is that we would consider them a mega church. And this mega church has a problem. So one of the things I love about scripture is that the scriptures don't like sugarcoat the message. They don't make it seem like everything was hunky-dory and everything worked out. It was all rainbows and ponies, that there were issues among the church. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers. I know you've never been in a church or been in an organization where people complained about other people in the church. Or in the organization, right? I, never, I know you've never been on a soccer team where, there, like you, comp- where you heard people complaining about those parents. Or you've been on an AAU basketball team and there was those parents. Or maybe it was that team. You know what I mean? You complain about that team. Well, this is happening in the church. The Greek-speaking believers, now these are Jews by blood, but Greek by culture. So they're part of what's called the diaspora. So anywhere that are the spread apart, cast out Jews that are living all throughout the Roman world. And they are Greek by culture, but their bloodline would be Jewish. They have come to faith in Jesus Christ and returned to Jerusalem. Now these, these uh, uh, Greek by culture, Jewish by birth believers feel as if their widows are being, and here's the word, discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. They were being missed by the daily distribution of food. So a little bit of context so that we understand what's going on. Widows in that culture really didn't have a lot of rights. So for them, unlike today where a widow could work, a widow didn't work. They relied on their family of origin in order to provide for them. So if in this case, what we're thinking or believing is that these widows had no remaining family of origin. They were left by themselves and there was no one to take care of them. So the church, hello, stepped in and said, there's no one to take care of you. We will take care of you. That was the role that the church felt it should play. And it's the role that the church does play today. But here we have a cultural discrimination happening in the church. They had gotten too big and an error cropped up. Now, from what we understand, you'll see it in a minute, we don't believe this was like purposeful, but it just happens. How many of you have been a part of an organization where they got, they scaled a little bit and unintended consequences happened, right? Things got missed. Emails didn't get returned. Conversations stopped happening. Well, in reality, even the best of organizations is going to fail and fall down at some level. Even the best organizations will make a mistake. Even the best of organizations will have errors. And so oftentimes when we're looking for, and I, I'm just gonna say this out loud, if you're watching online, this might be for you. If you're looking for a church that's error-free, you're not gonna find it. It's not possible for you to find a place where they make no errors, where nobody's missed, where it doesn't feel like. I mean, this is the feeling that they were being discriminated against. Because of our culture, we were being left aside in the daily distribution of food. And then look at the response. Acts 6 verse 2 says this. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. In other words, they didn't brush it aside. They were like, oh, you know what? You know, it's going to be okay. You know what I mean? We just, we just need you to deal with it. We'll get to it next year when we have the budget. They call everybody together. They're like, get the 5,000 people in a room or a field. I don't know what it looks like. By the sea, something. Get them all. Send out the invites. Get everybody you can. There was no like, you know, like they couldn't just send out a DM to everybody. Like there was like no group message. First of all, a 5,000 person group message would be a mistake, right? Everybody thumbs up and like, hey, we're meeting. Everybody's like, okay, okay, okay. And you're like, no, please, please don't get me off this group message, right? They didn't have any of that. So they sent out word, get the 
believers together. This is so important that the whole church has to gather. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Verse three, and so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected, full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. See, explosive growth led to unseen problems where the apostles had to take dramatic, drastic decision-making to solve it. And their way of solving it was, we need more leaders. We need more people. This was not serving food is beneath us. This was, this is so important, we can't segment our brain and our time to deal with it and preach the word, right? Like some of you have heard of this, like multitasking doesn't actually work, right? Some of you are like, no, I can multitask. You really can't. You can do two tasks half as well, right? Right? <laughs> Now, for many of you, your half as good is better than my, like, all good. So you can get away with it because you can multitask and, like, your half as good is fantastic. But single tasking is the idea that you can present 100% of your effort and time on one thing at one time and do the best possible work. And so what the, the, the apostles are saying is, like, we know that the word of God and the preaching of the word of God is so important that we can't multitask here. We can't do less of it. But we also know that serving people and that meeting their physical needs inside the church is so important that we need a whole group of people to do what we cannot do. See, often clarity brings opportunity. When you are clear about what God has called you to do, it, it helps define what you should and what you should not do. Clarity often brings about opportunity for other people so that when you know, I will do that, right? Because we all serve, like there's chairs to get set up and torn down in a church. Somebody has to sweep. Somebody's got to take out some garbages. There's some countertops that need to get wiped down. Babies need to be held. And some of you are like, that's not my gifting, but we still do it, right? However, we realize that when we define what we're supposed to do, that clarity creates opportunity for other people. Because we're like, I, that's not for me. I have this focus right in front of me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. So let's find people to do what I cannot do. Instead of you feeling like you're supposed to be the savior of the church, doing everything, responding to every email and every call to action. Some of you are incredible at this, and I'm so grateful for you because we can't do that without you. But at the same time, clarity about who you are supposed to be often creates opportunity for somebody else to step in. So we see three, uh, three uh, characteristics of these men. Number one, go back to, if you can bring up uh, verse three on the screen, that would be amazing. Um, and so I'm out of order and she already is like trying to track with me. So uh, we'll go uh, verse three on the screen. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected or of good report, somebody who they, someone speaks well of. So we see that as the first characteristic. And then the second one is full of the Spirit. And the idea of, the, of full here is it's a hollow vessel, like a vase that has been filled to the brim. He didn't say, go get people who are full of pride, full of self-confidence, right? Full of themselves. He said, go get people who are full to the brim. The vessel is full to the brim of the Spirit. Now, as we'll see, full of the Spirit, and as we've seen through Acts, is not just for some Christians, like those super Christians. You know what I mean? Like, you know people who, like, you've labeled them. They're like super Christians, right? They, they, like, they can pray at night and not fall asleep. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, they're super Christians. Oh, man, I bet you when they pray at 930, they don't fall asleep. But if I start praying at 10 o'clock, like, it's over. Like, that's how, that's my sleep program, right? <laughs> Right, they're always dressed nice, and everything, anything goes wrong. Those are the full of the spirit people. Now, I'm here to tell you that normal people, normal followers of Jesus, can be abnormally full of the spirit. That the requirement is that you just simply empty yourself 
so that you can be full of what God wants to do in your life. That you can walk full of the Spirit in your daily, everyday life. And throughout the book of Acts, God would continuously fill the followers of Jesus so that they would walk full of the Spirit. So we see them as well-respected, someone who speaks well of, walk, and somebody who walks full of the Spirit. And the second or the third thing we see is wisdom. They were full of wisdom. This is the Greek word Sophia. Now, wisdom is tricky in the scriptures because the definition for it is, de- is determined by the context that it lives in. So sometimes Sophia means the wisdom of God, God's great and glorious divine wisdom. Sometimes wisdom means uh, it's, it's uh, the ability to interpret dreams. Sometimes it's the understanding and the ability to teach the scriptures. It can mean knowledge or wisdom of Christ and his kingdom. But in this, it's determined by this word responsibility or another word might be administration. So they want people who are well-respected, full of the Spirit, and have are full of administration. Now, what I love about this is that they didn't pick people with a food handler's permit who had experience waiting tables. Oftentimes, we're looking for the people who have done the thing before. But what's most important is available people who are well-respected, full of the Spirit, and have a sense of wisdom over that area. They may have never done it. You may have never done it, but you're an organizer. Do you know what I mean? Like some of you, you're incredibly organized. Go look at your vehicles and it's like pristine. Or, or if it's not pristine, you're mad that it isn't pristine, right? And, and after this message, it will be pristine because you're thinking about it right now. Your closet, your pantry is ordered by the Lord, right? <laughs> some of you put your books not by title, but by color, Right? How many of you are like, I stack my books by color? No? Oh, wow. It has to be by tile. How many of you are like, I do use the Dewey Decimal System. It's a library. No, <laughs> Some of y'all don't even know what that is. Oh, uh, boy. Oh, boy. I'm um, getting old. Uh, but they had wisdom over administration and organization. And they were like, these are the people that we need. They might not have the direct experience, but we need people who are available. People talk well about them. They're full of the Spirit. And they have a gift or a wisdom over the area. See, they looked for wise spiritual people to solve a physical problem. They looked for wise spiritual people to solve a physical problem. This is priority. When we want to be like used in the church, it should be less about what skills can I develop and more about what God can do inside of me. It needs to be less about Um, I need to be a certain way or act a certain way or get the skills necessary in order to complete it. Instead, I need to be wise in the scriptures. I need to be full of the spirit and I need to be well regarded. That's how I get leadership. It's not about you know what to do. It's about you are the right person. Like we make the mistake when we get the wrong people who can do the right things. Mark and I, when we walk through, we pick up trash all the time. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying we can't do those things, but we are clear about our role, which creates opportunity for you to step in and do what we could not and sometimes should not do so that the preaching of the word can happen and the meeting of needs can happen. One is not necessarily more important than the other. Both are of incredible importance value. Verse five, everyone liked this idea. That's how you know that this is something crazy happening in the church. Everyone was like, that's a good idea. Committee was like, I love it. Unanimous vote. Let's go down the road. Oh, wow. Everybody, that's how you know it's from God, right? That they asked people what they should do. They chose the, and they chose the following. Now, here's what's interesting is all of these names are Greek or in technically could be Hellenist. So they could be from that group. We don't know if that's true necessarily because in the New Testament, everybody had three names, right? They had, a, they had a Jewish name, they had a Greek name, and they had a Roman name. So this could just be their Greek name up on the screen. That's all we know. We do know for sure Stephen, or Stephan as he likes to be called, uh, is a Hellenist. And so is, you can see it here, 
uh, Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. He's also a Hellenist. So they grabbed people from the community. They're like, oh, you have a problem. Okay, we're going to make sure that we get people who understand your culture really well. We're not going to solve it on our own. We're going to look for people who understand the culture really well, and then we're going to put them in places of responsibility and administration so that they can do what we don't know how to do. Everyone liked this idea. Verse 6, then the seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to The people liked it, and God blessed it. So let me give you a couple of observations about serving in church. A few observations about serving in this church based on what we're seeing in Acts chapter 6. And the first one is this. Serving is how you become great in the kingdom of God. Serving is how you become great in God's kingdom. There was a story of the disciples that are walking with Jesus and they are having a goat conversation, like who's the greatest of all time, right? Uh, we, we already know this. We already know who the greatest of all time. In basketball, it is Michael Jordan. It has been settled at North Creek. Uh, there is no other conversation. There's no LeBron. There's no Stephen Curry. None of that, okay? It is for sure Michael Jordan. And unfortunately, Tom Brady's the goat of the NFL, unfortunately. I wish it was not the case, but it is true. Uh, we just have to get on board with... Tom Brady being the goat, even though we might be sure that he sold his soul to the devil. I'm sorry, Tom, uh, <laughs> slipped out, Freudian slip. And Tiger Tiger Woods, y'all, is definitely the goat of uh, the PGA. Uh, and so some of you are like, mm. but the goat debate has been settled. I will not have a debate with you any longer. It is settled. And they're having a goat debate. Who is the greatest of all times? God, Jesus, you know, put us out at your right hand and your left. We want to be the greatest. We're here. Look at us. And Jesus responds to them with this in Matthew 20, 25. He says, Jesus called them together and says, you know, you know, disciples, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Verse 26, not so with you. Serving in the church is not about you. It's not how you build your kingdom. It's not how you build your resume. It's not how you build your name. Instead, whoever wants to become great must be your servant. He turns it all on his head. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Anyone that serves is great in the kingdom. So we say sometimes, like, you know, if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. That the greatness in the kingdom of God is about people who say, I want to serve. Serving is about becoming great. It's how you become great in God's kingdom when the word serve is to stoop low, to put yourself low, to submit to. It's not a great word. It's not a word I like, right? Because everybody wants to serve until you get treated like a servant, right? When people start telling you what to do, you're like, ah, hold on. I'm here to serve my wife, but you keep telling me what to do. Not my wife. My wife's incredible. (laughs) To stoop low, to serve, to submit to the ways of, to sacrifice for. That's what serving looks like. And greatness, how we become great in the kingdom is when we decide to stoop really low. I love it. We were on this missions trip and we got, you know, qualified people who are doing the craziest jobs you've ever seen, right? And that's the point, isn't it? Like, could we all have gone through there and picked the jobs that we were like the best at? Yeah. And some, we did some of those, but most of us just did things because they were in front of us. Like then that needs to get done. And I might be overqualified if, if there is such a thing. 
to do that thing. But we're going to stoop really low to serve. And what I love about, for many of you in this church, like I, what I love about a church is, like at the end of this, some of you are thinking like they're going to ask us to volunteer. But the reality is, is most of you are volunteering. That's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is that you've learned to stoop low. But in your serving, you have to be remind yourself that the how I become great in the kingdom is when I show up once a month and hold a child. When I show up every other week and, and make coffee. When I serve on the worship team, when I work with security, when I just greet people and shake their hand, maybe I don't shake their hand because they don't want to talk or touch nobody, but I say, hello, hi, how are you? Great to see you. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. They don't want to talk to me. They're out the door. Okay, good. But I did what I was supposed to do. And you stooped low and you've served. And how you become great in the kingdom is by serving. The second observation I want to see here is that serving is the way you become more like Jesus. Verse 28 of Matthew 20 says this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Serving is the way you become more like Jesus. Because you have the promise of everlasting life, you have the privilege to serve. Because you have been promised everlasting life, you have the privilege of serving like Jesus. And when you serve like Jesus, you become more like Jesus. Jesus said, I came, to, I came not to be served, but to serve and to sacrifice and ransom my life for many. Life-changing love is always defined by sacrifice. Life-changing service is always defined by sacrifice. We give up so that someone else can step up. We give up so somebody else can grow up. We give up so somebody else can work up. Like God can move in their life because we gave up. And when we participate in serving that way, you model Jesus to the rest of the world. The gospel of your life gets really loud. And the world sees a church that is willing to give up something in order to see somebody else gain something. They see a church who's like, oh my goodness, those people, those church people, I don't really believe like, like them, but I sure want to be with them because they know how to serve. And they know how to sacrifice. And serving is the way that we become more like Jesus, where we participate in his death and resurrection, where we participate in demonstrating the goodness of Jesus to the rest of the world. You don't become more like Jesus by just attending a church. You become more like Christ when you commit yourself to serve Jesus in whatever space or place that you find yourself. So serving is how you become great in the kingdom of God. Serving is the way you become more like Jesus. And last thing, serving is using whatever God gave you. Serving is using whatever God gave you. Romans 12 uh, verse 4 says this, for just as each of us are one body, so the church, this is an analogy, you are one body with many members or many parts and these members do not all have the same function. Now, in another place, he talks about like an eye, you're an eye, you're a hand, you're a nose, you're a whatever, whatever that we need one another. Like you can't say, an eye can't say to an ear, I don't need you because that would make no sense, right? Like you're, you can't say to your a feet, can't say to a hand, I don't need you. That wouldn't make sense. That we all have a place and we all have a function. Verse five, so in Christ, though many, multifaceted, you, many, though many of us, form one body, and each member belongs to all others. We have different gifts according to what? The grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encourage. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And some of you are like, well, my gift's not up there. But whatever that gift that you have, God wants you to exercise it in the church. You weren't 
made like I was made. Thank God. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Y'all don't need a church of me's in here. It would be awkward and difficult. But you have been uniquely gifted by God to serve his church. And the role that you have to play is to just use whatever God gave you. Just use whatever God gave you. I don't want you to use whatever God gave me. I don't want you to think, well, what would Pastor Chris say? I want you to think, what would I say? What would the Spirit of God say through me? What would Pastor Mark say? Okay, great. You can, you can use that as a construct. But what do you say? How would you do it? How would you approach it? How are you wired? The grace that God has given you needs to be poured out through you to benefit the church. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't know what that is. Well, let me just kind of give you a uh, kind of an idea uh, of how you can find um, what your gifting is. For many of you, you need to pay attention to where there's tension. It's the, thing of fr- it's the place of frustration, often. So I'm going to say it from the negative, and then I'll help you find the positive in it. Something frustrates you. Something bothers you. It's a place of tension. When you see it, you go, ah, oh, I wish they would. When you see it, you go, I, somebody ought to. There's an ought in it. It becomes imperative that that happens. Sometimes when we pay attention to our place of frustration or the place of tension, we discover our passion. That the thing that frustrates me might be this way that I've been wired. To go, oh, well, I know how to organize that. I know how to do that. I know how to do this. Like I was a, a, just a parent, a baseball parent of, in youth sports. And there's two types of, well, there's a lot of different types, but there's two prominent types of baseball parents. One is the complainer who always behind the back of the coach or sometimes to their face, they complain about how things are done. And then there's people like me who says, I am not happy with how things are being run. So I am just going to get involved and do my best to support whatever's happening here. So I became a, a, a coach not because I knew how to play baseball, but I was like, I can run practices. I can be organized. I can teach hitting. And I know how to find people to work around the things that I can, and to to do the things that I cannot do. I had to pay attention to the place of tension. And then that led to a passion of coaching people. And so I think that sometimes we need to start looking about what is that thing that bothers me the most? Maybe, just like they said, they were complaining. There was an issue. They were disturbed with how the, these, Hebra- or these Hellenistic Jews were being treated. And I was like, oh, okay. The apostles were like, you fix it. Sometimes where there's tension and frustration, God's like, guess who gets to step up? Guess who the one I've uniquely wired to solve the problem is you. And serving is just about using whatever gift God has given you, whatever you have from God, you just gotta use to bless the church of God. So these men were full of the Holy Spirit and they're full of wisdom, so I ask you, what are you full of? What are you full of? You've been making deposits in your life and there is something that you're full of that God is going to use on your, uh, uh, for his behalf. Some of you, it's like uh, you made deposits, you made experience deposits. You're full of experience. There's a lot of experience in the room. Maybe you have educational deposits. Maybe you've made, like me, you've made failure deposits and you're hoping, dear God, somebody needs to learn from my failure. And now I'm full of failure and I've made a lot of mistakes. And so if I can help anybody, I need to work out of what I'm full of. Maybe you have success deposits. Maybe you have relationship deposits. Maybe you have spiritual deposits. Maybe you have occupational deposits that you've made some deposits and you're full of it. And God's like, maybe that's the place that I'm going to use to help other people. And it's a place where you're full of. You may not be proud of, but you're full of. And God's like, that's the very much the place that I might use So let me uh, give you three ideas and then we'll close. How does God want you to serve? This way, there's a problem you can solve, there's a person you can reach, and there's a place that you can go. Number one, there's a problem you can solve. You are uniquely wired to solve problems that I can't solve, that this church staff can't solve without you. You see it, you know it, you can fix it. And when you're uniquely wired 
Maybe to solve a certain problem, maybe that's a place where you need to serve. There's a person that only you can reach. Do you know that? There's a, there's a, there's a people, like they say that we connect most over our uh, similarity or similarities, right? So our, the, the commonalities of people is how we, we generally interface in relationships, like whether they're perceived or they're actual. Like we, we think they, you know what I mean? Like you've met people, you're like, oh, they're just like me, but they're really not, you know, but you've like ladled on everything you want to believe about them. And, you know, and you tend to connect with people you feel are like you. Well, here's the thing. There's so many, the diverse of personality, the diversity of personality, the diverse of culture, of background, of upbringing, of socioeconomic status is why the church needs to stay that way because there are people like you that we have to reach. And you're the only one. You're it. Now, God's going to use somebody else if you decide not to go. But there's a person you can reach. There's a neighborhood that only you can reach. You live there. There's a person in your family that only you can reach. There's a friend that you've been texting with. Only you can reach. And there's a place that only you can go. Like, I can't walk into your workplace and start picking up tools and start working on computers or, you know, take your badge and badge into something. I, I can't go there. You can, though. And there's a place where you belong. And there's a place where you can go, where only you can serve. And maybe there's a problem you can solve, and maybe there's a person you can reach, and maybe there's a place you can go. Those are the places and the, and the spaces in which God wants to use you to serve the world, to become great, to be more like Jesus, and to use whatever you have. God wants you to serve. Maybe it's a problem you can solve. Maybe it's a person only you can reach. Maybe it's a place only you can go. These are the spaces and places in which God wants us all to stoop low and to serve. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, thank you for your son, Jesus, who sacrificed everything for us. Father, if anybody's in this room who, who is like wondering, uh, I need this sacrifice. I have sinned. I have fallen short. I've missed the mark. I'm not living the way I'm supposed to live. And the beautiful love of Jesus Christ who's been poured out for me, I want that to be my life today. Father, if anybody's in the room who wants to cross the line of faith, to trust you with their life, to have all their sins washed away, to become brand new through the blood of Jesus Christ and your work on the cross. Father, if anybody's room in this room, that's them. Today I pray that they would say yes to you. That yes, your cross is enough for their sin. That you have canceled the debt that they owe. And that today they are brand new, full of life and full of hope. Father, for those of us in this room who, Lord, you've been talking to us about serving. Lord, you've been working in our soul about how in ways we serve. Father, I pray that you'd help this church lead the way in serving our, our each other, God, in serving our neighborhood, our community, and the world. Lord, that people would be uh, astonished by the way the church of Jesus Christ is serving the world. Father, give us the grace today, the gift of your spirit to do what you've asked us to do. It is not by our own strength and effort, but by your spirit, says the Lord. And so, Jesus, today, we invite your, your spirit to come fill us up again, that we can walk full, and that we can serve the world around us. Father, give us that grace. In your matchless name, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here. We're so grateful for you, and you'd spend this weekend with us. We love you, we love you, we love you. If you have kids in the kids' ministry, go pick them up, come back. Stick around, say hi to some people around you. 